Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Informa Pharma Intelligence. This is Doro Shen, and I am the Thought Leadership Manager at Pharma Intelligence. And I want to thank you all for joining me today for the 2016 Clinical Trials Roundup, The Next Generation. The content of this webinar is based on an annual analysis that reviews the landscape of clinical trials that initiated in the prior calendar year, providing insight into our interests and intentions of the pharma industry currently stand. A few logistics before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording of today's event will be provided to registrants. Also, if you have any questions at any point during the presentation, please do enter them in the box below. I will leave some time at the end to address these questions, or we'll be sure to follow up afterwards via email as needed. For today's webinar, we'll delve into various aspects and metrics of the clinical research that started in 2016. First, we'll review the general landscape of these clinical trials, dissecting the data by therapeutic area and drug status, followed by a view of the diseases with the largest volume of new trials. We'll then move on to drivers of 2016 activity and identify who the top companies were overall and for each therapeutic area, as well as key diseases of interest for this active cohort. Finally, we'll take a look at country utilization for these trials by reviewing top trial locations, as well as the geographic breadth of trials for top sponsors, assessing the average number of countries used per study. Before we delve into the content, I first want to talk about the data behind this webinar. As I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar is based on the annual clinical trials roundup, which has been ongoing for some years now, and I started authoring the roundup starting last year. The roundup provides a high-level overview of the trial activity that initiated in the prior calendar year. And historically, this review focused on unapproved drug activity which are the drugs that have not received regulatory approval for any indication in any market. Also, the Roundup typically honed in on the major therapeutic areas of autoimmune inflammation, cardiovascular, central nervous system, which I'll refer to as CNS throughout the presentation, infectious disease, metabolic endocrinology, and oncology. This focus analysis did provide insights into competitive strategies for innovative drug development, as well as any unapproved biosimilars or me too drugs within key indications, but excluded the numerous label expansion trials, as well as activity within the smaller areas of genitourinary and ophthalmology. So this year, we've opted to expand the data set for the next generation of the clinical trials roundup in order to provide a fuller, more comprehensive view of the competitive landscape. The data set will continue to include phase one to three trials starting within 2016, but the inclusion criteria has been expanded to include all these trials regardless of the drug approval status or therapeutic area. The data source is Pharma Intelligence's Clinical Trials Intelligence Solution, Trial Trove, and the data was queried on July 7th 2017 through our trials API. As of the data snapshot date, TrialTrove captured a total of 6,067 clinical trials that initiated between January 1st and December 31st, 2016. One last note before we begin. Since the data set for this year's analysis does have different inclusion criteria that is more inclusive, and also has a later data snapshot date than last year's roundup, minimal comparisons will be made between the two years. Now, let's get started with a look at the 2016 trial landscape, which will be dissected by various metrics. We'll first start with a view by therapeutic area, and then analyze activity by the approval status of the drugs evaluated. After reviewing the landscape by drug approval status, we'll look at activity by trial phase before drilling down to the specific diseases targeted by the new trials 
and identifying the top indications of interest. As previously stated, Trial Trove captured 6,067 Phase 1 to 3 clinical trials starting in 2016. Oncology research dominated the new trial landscape with 2,442 trials, which is 40% of the total data set. Also, this is nearly three times more activity than the runner-up, CNS, which had 854 trials. CNS is closely followed by autoimmune inflammation and then infectious disease in fourth place. And between these three therapeutic areas, the sum total of their trials is still one trial shy of the robust cancer trial landscape, which the pharma industry clearly deems as a high priority for new clinical research. After infectious disease, the activity levels for the remaining therapeutic areas are on a much smaller scale, particularly for genitourinary and ophthalmology. Here, we add on an additional layer and differentiate the activity based on the drug approval status, which is depicted in three different views within this dashboard. First, at the top is a column chart that breaks down the trial count by therapeutic area and approval status, with unapproved drug trials represented by pink and trials that only evaluate approved drugs in purple. Moving clockwise, the distribution of trials by drug approval status and therapeutic area is provided by the chart in the bottom right. And the donut chart in the bottom left summarizes the overall distribution of trials by drug approval status. As you can see in the donut chart, the majority of phase one to three trials starting in 2016 do include at least one unapproved drug, specifically 57%. In terms of trial count across individual therapeutic areas, trials with unapproved drugs outnumber those focusing only on approved drugs, tipping new trial activity toward innovation. The area with the largest label expansion effort was CNS, and 48% of CNS trials evaluated approved drugs alone. Similar levels of approved drug activity were also observed within oncology and metabolic research, 46% for both. Approved drug activity for cardiovascular and genitourinary made up 42% of new trials for each therapeutic area, which was similar to the overall distribution for the data set as depicted in the donut chart. In contrast, label expansion comprised approximately a third of autoimmune and infectious disease research. But the starkest difference is observed within the smallest area ophthalmology, where only 28% of ophthalmological trials evaluated approved compounds alone, suggesting a higher level of innovation within this area. Now moving on to trial activity by phase, overall early to mid-stage research was most common with an equal proportion of phase one and two trials, both of which make up about a third of the landscape. And in a closer review of the data by drug status, the even distribution between these two phases can be attributed to the prolific phase two trial activity for approved drugs. 45% of trials only evaluating approved drugs were phase two, which is the largest proportion of activity by far. In comparison, the unapproved drug trials reflect the traditional drug development funnel, where phase one activity outpaces phase two, which in turn outnumbers phase three. For unapproved drug trials starting in 2016, phase one trials also comprise 45% of its activity, though phase two was 26%, and phase three was 15%. For the most active therapeutic areas, phase two activity was the largest proportion for oncology, CNS, and autoimmune at 41, 35, and 41% respectively. The second most common phase for each of these areas was phase one, ranging from 27 to 31%. 
Oncology research was particularly weighted toward early to mid-stage clinical development, and only 10% of anti-cancer trials were phase three. However, as you can see in the table of trial counts by phase in the bottom right, anti-cancer research still had the largest phase three volume while considering late stage activity by trial counts instead of the proportion. Even though the area has the smallest phase three percentage, the sheer volume of oncology research outpaces the other therapeutic areas. Considering both oncology and CNS had the largest efforts in label expansion, it wasn't surprising to find a large portion of phase two activity. For autoimmune, only 36% evaluated approved drugs alone, which is still sizable, but I decided to take a closer look to see what was fueling the phase two activity for these areas. And I found that for oncology, phase two activity was certainly driven by approved drug research. Two thirds of the phase two anti-cancer trials only evaluated approved drugs for additional markets. For CNS, phase two trials were nearly evenly split between unapproved and approved drug activity. But unapproved drug activity was the majority of phase two trials for autoimmune. So it appears that within this area, the pharma industry is keen to innovate and pursue development of new and unapproved drugs. Now, returning back to the dashboard for the trial distribution by phase, nearly all of the remaining therapeutic areas favor early phase activity. And phase one comprised between 36 and 49% of infectious disease, metabolic, cardiovascular, and genitourinary trials. After phase one, infectious disease trials were evenly distributed between mid and late stage research, while the other areas had slight preferences, but only a 3% difference between phase two and phase three. Metabolic had more phase two than three, while the opposite was true for cardiovascular and genitourinary. Again, ophthalmology proved to be an exception with the area's larger focus on later stage development. 38% of ophthalmology trials were in phase three, followed by 31% in phase two. Phase one was only 15% of all ophthalmology trials, but early stage clinical development for the area is bolstered by the comparable portion of phase one slash two research. Overall, these trial hybrids were generally uncommon, particularly the phase two slash three trials, but phase one slash two research was more frequent for ophthalmology as well as oncology, signaling the earlier movement of drugs into patients for these areas. Dissecting the data further, we reviewed the landscape by disease to identify the targets of these 2016 trials. Among the top 20 diseases by trial count, oncology reigned, and 65% were various cancer indications, including the top three diseases. First is non-small cell lung cancer, which had 353 trials starting in 2016, then breast cancer, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, both of which had trial counts nearing 300. Also near the top at fifth place is unspecified solid tumor, which is an indication that trial drug analysts use for trials seeking patients with solid tumors that have not yet specified the tumor type. The diseases outside of oncology span <clears throat> multiple therapeutic areas, with a single indication each from metabolic, CNS, and autoimmune. Cardiovascular and infectious disease both have two diseases making the top 20. And the, non, the top non-oncology diseases are led by respiratory infections, which is found at fourth place, then type 2 diabetes at six, and nociceptive pain at eight. Phase one was most common for the majority, while seven had the most activity in phase two. And this includes the three cancers at the top, as well as nociceptive pain, pancreatic, liver, 
head and neck, and prostate cancer. None had phase three as the largest proportion of trial activity. However, nociceptive pain was close and only had a single study difference between phase two and phase three. In another view of the top 20 diseases depicted on the last slide, we took a look at the phase-specific rankings for these key indications, breaking out the major phases and excluding the mixed-phase trial. The same range is used for the x-axis in each of the charts to provide a sense of scale of activity between the three phases. On the far left, we see that unspecified solid tumor had the largest number of phase one trials initiated in 2016, followed by the leading non-oncology indication of respiratory infections. Two other non-oncology diseases are also toward the top for phase one activity, which are type two diabetes and HIV. The middle portion of the slide contains the phase two ranking with NSCLC, breast cancer, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma leading, and in the same ranking as the prior slide where we considered the total activity. However, this time colorectal cancer and nociceptive pain follow in fourth and fifth place. Finally, on the right is phase three, where we see nociceptive pain as the biggest target for late stage development holding the largest volume of phase three research among the top diseases. Again, respiratory infections come in second, followed by type two diabetes. And generally, the diseases outside of cancer have the largest volume of phase three trials with dyslipidemia, rheumatoid arthritis, and hypertension also toward the top. For oncology, the prolific areas of non-small cell lung and breast cancer have the largest number of phase three trials. Next, let's take a look at the drivers for 2016 and identify who the key players are. We'll review activity first by company and then provide an overview of these key players activity by phase, therapeutic area and disease. In this section, we'll also identify who the leading companies were for each individual therapeutic area. A total of 1,448 trials, or nearly a quarter of all 2016 trials, were initiated by the 20 most active companies depicted in this slide. The stacked bar chart on the left provides the trial counts by phase for each of the sponsors, while the right side depicts the distribution of each company's total trial activity by drug approval status. The trials included in the counts here represent each study that the company was involved in, both as a sole sponsor, as well as any collaborative research. As such, trials with multiple sponsors will be counted for each company involved and the sum total of the trials depicted here will exceed the total number of distinct studies initiated by this group. At the top is AstraZeneca, who has been the leader in prior clinical trial roundups, even though approved drug activity has now been included. AstraZeneca is followed by the runner-up Merck and Johnson & Johnson in third place. Nearly all of these top 20 companies included here have appeared in prior versions of the Roundup, except for Jiangsu Hengrei Medicine. This new entrant to the top 20 cohort is the largest ethical pharmaceutical company in China and initiated a similar volume of phase one to three research in 2016 as Bayer and Daiichi Sangyo. For most of the cohort, activity was weighted toward phase one and accounted for the largest portion of trials for 12 companies. Four companies favored phase two, which were Merck, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Gilead, and Astellas. Three opted to focus efforts in phase three, 
and these companies were Abbey, Santa Fe, and Novo Nordisk. Takeda equally distributed the largest number of trials between phase one and three. And while Stellis was one of the companies who had the largest activity in phase two, the distribution among the three major phases was nearly even. Estella started 13 trials each for phase one and phase three, and 14 phase two studies. Moving to the right side of the dashboard, most of this cohort devoted more of their new research in 2016 to unapproved drugs. But the balance between unapproved and approved drug activity varied widely. Among companies prioritizing approved drug research, Merck and BMS had the largest proportion largely due to ongoing development for Keytruda and Nativo and additional markets. Sanofi is another company with a large concentration of activity with approved drugs across a variety of indications, including type 2 diabetes, multiple vaccines, and dyslipidemia. A few companies have comparable efforts between unapproved and approved drug trials, balancing innovation and development of biosimilars and Me2 drugs with strategic use of approved assets for new geographic and patient markets. And this includes Roche, Novartis, and Pfizer. There were also a handful of companies who heavily focused their 2016 trials on unapproved drugs, notably Daiichi Sankyo, with 92% devoted to unapproved drug research. Now, to gauge portfolio management strategies, the distribution of therapeutic areas for each of the top 20 companies was evaluated. And while strategies do vary, and some companies focus on a primary therapeutic area, while others distribute efforts across multiple areas, oncology remains a key priority for this cohort in general. 15 of the 20 companies dedicated the largest portion of their trials to anti-cancer efforts, which ranged from J&J's 34% to Celgene's 79%. Infectious disease was a distant runner-up, and this therapeutic area comprised the largest portion for three companies, who were GlaxoSmithKline, Gilead, and Sanofi, with a lower range of Sanofi's 33%, to Gilead's 46% due to comparable trial activity and other therapeutic areas for each of the sponsors. As far as portfolio management, Novo Nordisk exemplifies therapeutic focus with the highest concentration of new trial activity in a single therapeutic area. Approximately 90% of Novo Nordisk's new research was devoted to metabolic. Celgene had the second highest proportion within a single therapeutic area, with the previously mentioned 79% of their trials devoted to oncology. In contrast, Sanofi distributed its research across multiple therapeutic areas with larger amounts of activity within infectious disease, metabolic, and autoimmune, in addition to smaller efforts in CNS, cardiovascular, and oncology. GSK also targeted a diverse range and initiated trials in all therapeutic areas except ophthalmology. Their activity primarily focused on infectious disease and autoimmune, followed by metabolic, and then oncology. Now that we've identified the top 20 companies who initiated the most trials overall in 2016 and touched on their therapeutic areas of interest, we'll shift gears a bit and identify the leaders for the specific therapeutic areas. Do these same companies also drive new trial activity when honing in on individual areas? In short, the answer is yes. According to this table that summarizes the top five companies by trial count for each individual therapeutic area, the key players generally remain the same, but there is a shuffling of the leading companies per therapeutic area due to different priorities. 
AstraZeneca remains at the top for autoimmune, but that's the only therapeutic area where the company holds the number one spot. J&J is the only company to lead multiple areas, topping both CNS and infectious disease. Merck is number one for oncology, while Daiichi Sanjo leads cardiovascular activity. Novo Nordisk is found at the top for metabolic, unsurprisingly, considering their sharp focus on the area. Companies outside of the top 20 cohort do have a presence, particularly within the smaller areas of genotinerinary and ophthalmology. These two areas have non-top 20 companies as the leader, Mithra Pharmaceuticals for genotinerinary and Allergan for ophthalmology. Other non-top 20 companies that make the cut are Synthon and Teva, who are also at the forefront of genotinerinary activity and Regeneron for ophthalmology. Asperion Therapeutics sneaks into the top five for cardiovascular, while Biogen and Isai are included as leaders for CNS. Meanwhile, Veed Healthcare is included as a leading infectious disease company. However, this could be considered an indirect appearance of the top 20 cohort. Although Veed has been established as its own entity, it was created as a joint venture between Pfizer and GSK in 2009 to spin out their own HIV efforts into a specialty company, which was later expanded to include a non-top 20 company, Shinogi, as a partial owner in 2012. Now shifting back to the top 20 cohort, we again hone in on the specific diseases targeted by their activity. The disease focus does shift when limiting the data set to the top 20 companies, but NSCLC continues to be the leading indication, followed this time by a specified solid tumor and then breast cancer. Overall, the spotlight shines a little brighter on oncology with the total number of cancers increasing to 15. Also, the number of therapeutic areas outside of oncology decreased, with an almost even split between metabolic, autoimmune, and infectious disease. In comparison to the rankings of the top 20 diseases from the overall data set, there are some noticeable shifts, indicating different priorities for these active companies. For instance, rheumatoid arthritis appears to be of greater interest to this cohort advancing to seventh place from its overall rank of 20th. Melanoma is also a bigger priority for the group, moving up to sixth place from 12th. And a few indications appear to be slightly deprioritized, such as respiratory infections, which fall to 14th place from 4th, and five diseases exit the top 20. Nociceptive pain, HIV, gastric cancer, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Instead, the cohort opts to focus efforts on multiple myeloma, HCV, psoriasis, renal cancer, and bladder cancer. Phase one continues to prevail as the most common development phase and leads in trial volume for 14 diseases. The top 20 cohort continues to weight cancer activity toward early phase development with unspecified solid tumors leading. Five diseases have the largest volume of initiated activity in phase two development, all of which are different types of cancers. And these are breast, NHL, multiple myeloma, head and neck, and renal. And HCV was the lone indication to have phase three as their most robust area, driven by ongoing efforts from Abvi and Gilead. But these are the overall targets, ignoring drug development strategies. Which of these indications are more likely to be targeted for initial approvals of pipeline drugs? And what about the top diseases for label expansion? Or are new diseases targeted by these different strategies? To determine the answers to those questions, we identified the diseases, the largest trial volume for each approval status 
to determine whether there were any differences based on drug development strategy. This analysis looked across all the diseases targeted by the top 20 companies and was not limited to the set of indications shown on the last slide. Starting with unapproved drug activity on the left, the same top three cancers remain in the lead. Unspecified solid tumor activity is certainly driven by unapproved drug evaluations, which made up 80% of trials initiated for this general indication. The leading diseases for unapproved drugs do largely remain the same, but looking toward the bottom of the chart, smaller areas activity reveal different indications of interest for first approval. Besides unspecified cancer, which is another generalized indication used by trial trove for oncology studies that have not yet specified the cancer type, other new diseases comprising the focus of the top 20 companies' novel drug activity are HIV, COPD, gastric cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and hypertension. On the right, we have the approved drug trial, which does indeed reflect different disease interests and rankings for label expansion activities. And the CLC and breast cancer continue to have the largest trial volume, but type 2 diabetes takes third place. Multiple myeloma, which does not appear in the top 20 disease list for unapproved drug activity, emerges as a key indication for market expansion efforts. Again, the tail end of the top 20 diseases includes additional targets for this cohort's efforts to evergreen their already approved assets. And these include HCV, other inflammatory infections, liver cancer, thrombotic disorders, glioblastoma, and esophageal cancer. Digging deeper into company-specific priorities, the leading indications for individual players are reviewed here, limiting the top diseases to the indications that have at least three or more trials initiated in 2016. These are generally limited to the top three diseases, unless there are, large, there are a large number that ties with second or third place. In all, 41 distinct indications are the primary targets of trial activity for this active group. And a number of diseases have multiple companies prioritizing their new trial activity to buy for a piece of the market. There are also a number of unique priorities where only a single company has indication as one of their top diseases based on trial counts. And as an ongoing theme, anti-cancer efforts are clearly a unifying endeavor considering only four companies do not include any oncology indications as a top priority which are GSK, Gillian, Sanofi, and Novo Norisk. On the other hand, some of the most active sponsors, such as AstraZeneca, Merck, Roche, and BMS, primarily target cancer. For the most common diseases, NSCLC's top billing and overall trial activity for the cohort was a concentrated effort from seven companies who have the cancer as a top disease. In fact, the total number of NSCLC trials initiated by these seven companies alone make up 79% of all non-small cell lung cancer studies from the top 20 cohorts. However, the most common key area was unspecified solid tumor, with nine company, companies starting the most trials for this first solid tumor trials without disclosing the specific tumor type. And six companies also rallied behind the common causes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, as well as type 2 diabetes. A total of 24 indications were a unique priority to a single company. And I've highlighted the top ones here based on trial count. At the top is HCV, which is a top disease only for Gilead whose concentrated efforts were the driving force in new research against the virus. Gilead was responsible for 43% of all HCV trials initiated in 2016 by the top 20 cohorts. 
Although I previously mentioned AbbVie's robust Phase 3 HCV activity, this was actually the company's only effort in the Hep C arena, and AbbVie opted to initiate more clinical research in other areas, mostly oncology. Asthma was a key indication for AstraZeneca, tying their activity in the popular unspecified teletumor arena. And other unique missions are head and neck cancer for Merck, hypertension for Daichi Sankyo, unspecified cancer for Eli Lilly, and depression for J&J. Next in this last section, we'll review key locations for the newly initiated trials, which also provide insight into potential company strategy and the markets of interest. Adding additional granularity, such as patient populations, can help identify countries that may be oversaturated with competitive activity. But today, we'll provide a bird's eye view of the top destinations for the 2016 trial for a general sense of the landscape. We'll review the overall key locations across the entire data set, followed by the top locations for each individual therapeutic area, as well as the most active sponsors. In addition to identifying the specific countries of interest, we'll assess the geographic breadth of trials, again, with a focus on the top 20 companies. For the locations analysis, we reviewed the specific countries that have been disclosed in the public domain as a trial location for the data set. In general, the top 10 countries for newly initiated studies in 2016 primarily span the U.S., Japan, and most major EU markets, which were France, Germany, Spain, and the United Kingdom. And as far as the major EU markets go, although Italy does not make the cut, the country actually just missed the mark by a few trials and came in 12th place. A few emerging markets, such as Russia, also hosted a robust level of new trial activity in 2016. But overall, the United States remains the most frequented location based on trial count, followed by China. Across the individual therapeutic areas, similar countries are generally targeted with some regional preferences. And the top common countries are highlighted here to the right with the U.S. and Germany as a location for all therapeutic areas. Other top EU countries include the U.K. for all areas but genitourinary, as well as France and Spain. East Asia is also common, as all areas include one or more countries from the region. Japan and or China are the most frequented East Asian countries for all therapeutic areas with ophthalmology, who opts for a larger volume of trials in South Korea. Russia, which was a top location overall, remains a key market for all, for all except for oncology. A number of locations were unique choices for a single or only two of the therapeutic areas. Eastern Europe rarely makes the top 10 locations by trial count from most, but Poland and Hungary are top locations exclusive to autoimmune and ophthalmology, respectively. Other countries targeted by a single therapeutic area include Netherlands for cardiovascular and Egypt for genitourinary. Then there are a few countries included in trials for just two therapeutic areas, Italy, Australia, Iran, and India. We also conducted an analysis of the top 10 most active companies to determine their top 10 locations by trial count, which is summarized in this heat map. Countries with darker shades of purple are those targeted by the largest number of companies, while countries in the lightest shades are locations unique to a single company. For reference, the top 10 companies included in the analysis are listed in the table to the left. 
Similar to the therapeutic area analysis, we find both common themes and outliers for the smaller set of active companies, reflecting their overlapping yet distinct strategic plans. And to help illustrate this, we summarize the top countries for these active companies within the table. The locations are listed in descending order first by the number of companies that have a country as a top location and also the total trial count, which isn't included in the table. For the countries targeted by six to nine companies, we specify the companies who did not include that country as one of their top 10 locations, while countries with five or less companies include the company names who did target that country. In comparison to the overall key location, these active sponsors all opted to include the US, Germany, the UK, Spain, France, and Canada as a top location. Russia is only a key destination for two companies, AstraZeneca and Sanofi, while China drops out as a key location completely due to regulatory constraints. Japan is missing as a top location for J&J and Novartis, and instead, J&J focuses their Asia-Pacific efforts on Australia, while Novartis opts for the East Asian market of South Korea. Italy is unearthed as a top location for all companies but Pfizer, and there's also a larger Eastern European presence, with multiple companies targeting Poland, while AstraZeneca and Pfizer target Hungary, and Boehringer Engelheim is a sole company with the Czech Republic as a frequent destination. Other differing markets of interest include Belgium and Netherlands for four companies each, and Australia for five. And finally, Eli Lilly is the sole company to include Mexico as a top location. Finally, we reviewed the geographic breadth of the trials initiating in 2016, looking at the average number of countries disclosed per trial for the top 20 cohorts, both overall as well as by phase. This analysis excludes trials with no publicly disclosed location, and also due to trial count numbers. The mixed phase trials were rolled into the calculations for the higher phase of development. For instance, any phase one slash two trials would have been included in the calculations for phase two. Across the full set of the 20 most active companies, an overall average of 4.6 countries were disclosed per trial, which ranged from Jiangsu Hungary's one to AbbVie's 7.6. This overall average is slightly higher than the typical trial size of phase two research which averaged 4.2 countries per trial for this cohort. Although phase two research does have an upward range of Novo Nordisk 15.5 countries, this does appear to be an exception since the second highest average was a more modest 6.5 countries. Unsurprisingly, the geographic breadth for these trials expands with the increasing phase of development to accommodate the larger target accruals required for pivotal phase three research. Phase one trials had an overall average of 1.6 countries per trial, with a max of Novartis' 3.5, which expanded to an overall average of 10.4 countries for phase three. Novartis also has the largest mean here, disclosing an average of 15.8 countries per phase three trial. There were a few exceptions to the expanding geographic breadth with the progressing development phase. Jiangsu Hengri consistently disclosed a single country for their trials, regardless of the trial phase, often to focus their efforts either in their home base of China or Australia. Also, Novo Nordisk and Sanofi disclosed the largest number of trials or countries for their phase two studies. And as I previously mentioned, Novo Nordisk disclosed an average of 15.5 countries for the phase two, but only averaged 10 for phase three. Sanofi's differences are more modest, an average 6.2 and 4.6, 
for their phase two and three trials respectively. The two most active companies, AstraZeneca and Merck, average fewer countries per trial than the overall average of 4.6. Both also had much lower averages for their phase two trials. And AstraZeneca's phase three country utilization was well below the mean, which could indicate a sharper focus on key markets or perhaps be a strategy to mitigate R&D costs, given the volume of new research for both companies in comparison to their peers. And with that, I'd like to wrap up the roundup with some food for thought. Overall and across individual therapeutic areas, phase one to three clinical trials initiated in 2016 were more likely to evaluate unapproved drugs. With growing complexity, rising costs, and the high-risk nature of drug development, will innovation continue to outpace repurposing of already approved drugs? Perhaps so, considering approval in one indication does not guarantee success in another, which was indicated in an analysis of completed trial outcomes that was conducted by my colleague, Dr. Christine Blazinski, who found that within the active areas of oncology, autoimmune, and CNS, only 30 to 46 percent of label expansion trials completing in 2016 achieved their primary endpoints. The ongoing battle against cancer clearly holds the attention of the pharma industry, particularly with the hot areas of immune oncology. Will this bubble ever burst? Or will anti cancer efforts continue to comprise a lion's share of clinical development? We also saw that a small cohort of companies drive a large portion of new trial activity, with 20 companies responsible for one in four trials initiated in 2016. It's likely these pharma giants will continue to drive new activity, or will they? Will the same players continue to dominate trial starts? And lastly, early and mid-stage research comprise the majority of the new trial landscape fueling clinical development of drugs that may or may not make it to the next step. Which of these candidates will prove their worth and progress through the R&D development cycle? We'll find out next year for the next version of the Roundup, so stay tuned. And now with the time we have left, we'll enter the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, okay, so in light of the popularity of oncology and of combination trials, is there any sense of the percentage of trials that are sponsored by uh, collaborative efforts between the industry? So in a recent webinar given by Christine Bozinski on her completed trials analysis, she actually looked closer at the collaborative trials that completed in 2016 and found that a higher percentage of industry co-sponsored oncology trials met their primary endpoints in comparison to the overall success rate. So I actually did start to look into the level of collaboration within oncology trials that initiated in 2016 out of curiosity. I found that um, just over 900 trials were collaborative efforts, so just over a third of the oncology trials. But most of these collaborations either took place between non-industry groups or between a single industry sponsor and a non-industry group, such as a government organization, hospital or academic center, or cooperative group. About 200 trials were joint efforts between multiple industry sponsors, so about 8% of all oncology trials initiated in 2016. So for oncology, it appears that the most common collaboration is actually between a single industry sponsor and a non-industry group. Um, and I just received a question asking about the slides, um, if they can be provided since they are more comprehensive than the white paper. And yes, we can uh, provide a copy of those. Um, and let's see, nope, we just got a question about what were the most significant changes compared with 2015 data, and were there any surprises? 
So as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, prior roundups focus on unapproved drug activity within the six major therapeutic areas, and this excluded genotinary and ophthalmology. And also the snapshot date for the review of 2015 data was in February 2016, where the snapshot for this year's analysis is in July 2017. So the level of reporting will differ as more trials or details on trials are disclosed over time. But moving forward, we will maintain the same inclusion criteria and similar data snapshot dates to allow for year-on-year -year comparisons. With that said, although the original analysis of 2015 data only looked at unapproved trial activity due, due to a client request, I actually did reevaluate the data set to include all drug types and identify the top 20 companies. So in comparison to that analysis, one surprise was the appearance of Jiangsu Hengri Medicine, who had ramped up their trial activity and entered the top 20 cohort of the most active industry sponsors. Novo Nordisk was also missing from last year's top 20 cohort, uh, missing the mark by just a few trials. The top 20 players for 2015 activity that dropped out in this year's analysis, which had totaled 21 due to a 20th place high, were Amgen, Utsuka, and Sumitomo Dainippon Pharma. And since I also looked at the top diseases based on drug approval status for the top 20 cohort in this year's analysis, I can note a few comparisons with 2015 there, as there were some changes. Um, I'll go back to slide 18 as I talk about this. Uh, so you can have that as a reference. Um, and since this includes a 2016 unapproved drug activity on the left. The top three are consistent, um, specified solid tumor and a CLCM breath, but a number of diseases dropped in the rankings or off the list completely in comparison to 2015. Renal cancer and gnosis of the pain were in the top diseases for 2015, but neither made the cut this year. HIV, asthma, and HCV were in sixth, seventh, and eighth place, respectively, in 2015. And as you can see, they dropped in their rankings between 2015 and 2016, particularly asthma and HCV. There are also diseases that rose in the ranks, such as type 2 diabetes, due to the inclusion of Novo Nordisk in the top 20 cohort, who initiated 12 of the 40 type 2 diabetes studies. Rheumatoid arthritis and melanoma were other diseases that increased in trial activity. These three indications were found in the latter half of the top 20 for 2015. And lastly, pancreatic cancer did not make the cut for 2015 activity, was found in the eighth place spot for 2016. Um, and it looks like that is it for the questions. Um, so thank you again for joining us today and for your attention. A recording of the webinar will be made available to all registrants and should be provided in the upcoming days. But if you think of any questions afterwards or if any other comments, please do feel free to reach out to pharma at informa.com. Thank you, and have a great rest of the day.